Well, good morning and welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder and this is BRN AM for Monday, December 28th, 2020. And our top stories today, target date fund evolution continues and new year and new retirement priorities and opportunities. Well, joining me now to discuss this and a lot more is Randy Plavica. He's a journalist with Fund Intelligence. Randy, happy new year. Great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Happy New Year to you as well, Jeff. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing quite well. I'm, I'm looking forward to 2021, I can tell you. Uh, but let's, let's jump in because you've been on the beat, you've been on the trail of the latest in retirement plans and target date or target date fund design. What can you tell us? What are you, what are you hearing from manufacturers out there? Yeah, I think 2020 presented a really interesting inflection point for a lot of target date providers, right? It gave them an opportunity to see were my retirement funds that were five years, 10 years, or even, you know, just now coming into uh, uh, into incorporation for retirement investors, are they adequately equipped to handle volatility? Uh, I think it presented a really interesting point, like I said, for a lot of these providers to think about how they're designing their target date fund, how they're doing their mix how they're exposing to the equity markets, obviously that saw a pretty big dislocation in March, uh, and where they're looking diver for diversification uh, in the new year. Uh, in those conversations, I, I, the most common theme that I've heard is people really want to drill down on their fixed income offerings. They really want to make sure that their bond exposures are uh, appropriately weighted, and they really want to make sure that ultimately they almost have a, a layer of protection in there. Uh, it brings up a really interesting topic about you know, involving some insurance and annuities almost in the target date space. And uh, for some companies that have insurance arms already, it's a pretty easy uh, integration. And for other pure asset managers that are just target date providers, no insurance arm uh, presents a really interesting opportunity for them to partner with the insurance providers. And I think uh, we're going to see more development on that front for sure. But right now, the avenues are kind of uh, wide open. I've not seen any one firm land on any one road to take on this path. Uh, a lot of them have different arms and different different you know, paths going along this, whether it's annuities or guaranteed, non-guaranteed income. Uh, I think it's a really interesting product development area that I'm definitely going to keep a close eye on, especially in 2021. And Randy, anecdotally, how did the target date fund man manufacturers and managers do during this la the last nine, 10 months during this pandemic? Any thoughts about that? Uh, they held up fairly well. Uh, you know, when we look at some of the industry data, you know, outflows weren't as bad as I think some of the general mutual funds were. Uh, performance obviously is going to mirror what they're tracking if they're an index, but some of the active managers, uh, especially those that were able to, I guess, have a little bit of foresight here, uh, pulled in really well, right? You had some firms like Dimensional Fund Advisors and a couple others, uh, you know, that really came through Capital Group, I guess, to name one as well, that came through and, you know, they saw the volatility happening. They were able to either correct for it or they already had that built in uh, and they didn't have to correct for it. They were just able to rely on what their teams had already put on the ground. and. Uh, I, I think the target date space, uh, you know, I was a little bit surprised that it, you know, didn't suffer as poorly as kind of the rest of the market did, which was almost a good thing. I, I prefer that surprise to uh, being the opposite end where it would do worse than expected. But, um, you know, I, I think overall, um, you know, not as bad as it could have been is, is a good thing for 2020, uh, especially considering all the volatility that we saw. And, and in terms of fees, I mean, have we seen fees come down for these what are essentially blended multi-asset products. I mean, have you seen, you know, I, I know that forgetting the, the indexing aspect, which is always going to drive prices down, but have prices continued to fall when I, when I'm talking about prices, obviously basis points or percentage of assets, have you seen that kind of decline? Yeah, actually. And, and most recently, I guess the biggest mover we saw was Vanguard dropped its plan uh, investment minimum from about hundred million to 5 million on its institutional grade stuff, um, which is a huge move, right? They're a monolith in this space. They, they command like 36 some odd percent of the space uh, at any given point, and I'm sure it fluctuates, but um, we've seen a little bit of movement and we've especially seen movement as CIT adoption has increased, both within firms launching the new products and then investors getting into them too. Um, obviously CITs present a, a little bit of a cheaper avenue, a little bit more tax efficiency that you don't otherwise get out of a traditional target date mutual fund. Uh, but overall, I think it's continuing, but it's not at an avalanche pace. It's definitely you know chipping away one basis point at a time. Um, I haven't seen any major price cuts this year that have, uh, you know, been too concerning or anybody trying to undersell anybody too much. But I think overall it's still competitive and the fee pressure is still there. Yeah, I just wonder whether or not they've received some pressure from the managed account providers because that, you know, we've, we talked about that earlier in the year. I think it was pre-pandemic pre, pre -pandemic, 
or maybe it was during the pandemic. I don't know. Regardless, we, we talked about that. And, and, you know, the managed account providers have really started to gain some steam inside the retirement plans. Yeah, absolutely. And they and they want the best what they can get for the lowest price. So that's kind of the, the name of the game with managed accounts. And um, there's ways of achieving that, right? Um, you know, you can make a certain sleeve of your investments all passive and just track the index and then really only do active where you think and you know you can you can beat the benchmark. And um, we're definitely seeing a lot of that, too. I think the, the demand for managed accounts is still going to be here in 2021. Um, the pricing might change a little bit, especially as we get a lot more providers that either a open up their platforms uh, to you know investments that aren't on their own menu, um, or b we start to see in-house offerings get their prices driven down, whether it's from competition, uh, more efficiencies they achieve, or if they grow via scale. And last question, Randy. I mean, we're still in the throes. You know, we, you and I are connecting virtually, of course. What about distribution? I mean, if I'm a customer, uh, whether I'm an institutional customer or a retail customer. What about gaining access and presenting, you know, you mentioned there are multiple flavors of Target A Fund. How, are, how, how has distribution or sales changed in the, in the last 10 months? Yeah, I, I think for the most part, every distribution leader I've talked to at these different retirement firms, they still want to be all virtual uh, for as long as it is, you know, safe and, you know, recommended to do so. Uh, I think they want to be the, the first in line once the essential workers and healthcare workers receive. They definitely want to be um, back out in the field when it's when it's viable. But um, we've seen some interesting things in terms of virtual forums. We've seen uh, people retool their entire presentations to be more interactive over a Zoom or over a Skype or a Teams call, whatever whatever forum you're using. Uh, instead of just making a presentation you would give in person, where it's you know here's point A, point B, point C, selling them on the features. Nowadays, when you're connecting over Zoom and over Teams, it's really geared toward getting to know the investor as much as it is getting to know the provider. Uh, I think, you know, from some of the firms that I've seen uh, present in this way, um, they definitely know how to foster the connection virtually. Um, I'm sure that we all, you know, miss, you know, shaking hands or, you know, going to lunch together, grabbing a coffee, grabbing a drink, et cetera. Uh, but I think they've found ways to hurdle it because everybody's in the same situation right now. Uh, and in person, obviously, would, would be nice for, I think, some people if it were safe to do so. But uh, for the most part, there's not been a lot of hurdles. I mean, I'm sure that some firms saw a little bit of a, a drop off maybe over the summer when people started to go offline just a touch more. But uh, I think right now it's only picking up and I, there's really an appetite for it and uh, uh, an understanding that, you know, virtual is going to be how we sell uh, for the next little while here. Yeah. Well, Randy, I want to take a very quick break. When we come back, we'll talk to Randy about his thoughts for 2021 when it comes to retirement and retirement legislation. So stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We wanna make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Hi folks, Joe Namath here, and if you're on Medicare, this is important. 
you're now entitled to eliminate co-pays and get dental care, dentures, eyeglasses, prescription coverage, in-home aids, unlimited transportation, and home-delivered meals, all at no additional cost. Plus, your zip code may have coverage with the give-back benefit that adds money back to your Social Security check every month. Look, with the uncertainty of the virus and vaccines, you need to get everything you're entitled to. Here's the bottom line. Call to get significant benefits at no additional cost and see if your zip code has coverage with the give back benefit. Millions of people have trusted the Medicare coverage helpline. You can too. Call now. It's free. Call 1-800-924-3920. That's 1-800-924-3920. Welcome back. We're talking to Randy Plavica of Fund Intelligence. Randy, thanks for staying with us this morning. Of course. Thanks for having me back. And I'm really jealous. I got to tell you, just before we get into the second segment, you have a beautiful background behind you. Uh, I'm just amazed. I hope you're enjoying the weather in, in sunny California. All right. Yeah. So go ahead, Ren. I do my best to, you know, obviously it's, it's hard to have fun in 70 degrees, but, uh, you know, I don't mind it too much. Yeah. And it's not a Zoom background. So, Randy, let's talk about 2021. It's, it's uh, a couple days away now. And, uh, you know, just looking out, what, what are you thinking about? What are you writing about? What are you hearing about in terms of retirement in 2021? Yeah, I think the overarching theme that I've heard is that the defined contribution space is going to look more like the defined benefit or pension space, as we would otherwise know it. Um, and it's happening through a few different ways and a few different means. But, uh, you know, the overarching theme is that retirement providers right now are looking to regain their hold on being the whole package supplier. They want to be with people from the day they start investing in retirement until the day they uh, either A, enroll out of their plan or B, stick with it into retirement and start generating some income. Uh, it's a really interesting facet in that, you know, we can start combining financial wellness with a traditional re retirement plan, bringing in healthcare benefits or healthcare savings more so, uh, bringing in college savings, debt, you know, elimination, debt reduction, uh, and all of a sudden, the retirement uh, savings landscape is going to start to just look like the savings landscape overall with a pretty big retirement lens on it. But that seems to be kind of the general theme pushing through. Um, you know, there's obviously some interest around private equity, private alternatives and other stuff I'd happy to be dive into. But but of course, the DC to BB, DB trend seems to be the most prominent here. And in terms of access, I mean, we, we've talked throughout the year, both you and I and others, about getting people to have access to retirement plans. So many Americans, I think there's 60 or 70 million, do not have access to a 401k or 401k type plan. What about the expansion of PEPs, MEPs, and all things above? Any, any, any word on that? Yeah, we actually have a few key providers that are already launching into that space. I think one of the very first ones to move on, it was Voya and Aon back, uh, God, probably about mid-year. Uh, and they were like, we're going to have a PEP on Jan 1. And all of a sudden, all these firms, a lot of record keepers were like, we're going to have a PEP as well. Uh, the means by which they achieve that, obviously, are still to be revealed. But uh, I think so far, by my count, we have at least a half dozen major, la half dozen major launches. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to have plenty more. Um, now, when I talk to the actual people, as far as it goes, as to supplying the PEPs or basically uh, running the PEPs, um, they have a lot of hope for it in the small to micro plan space. Um, they also have a lot of hope for it in the mega plan space, i.e., taking a bunch of large plans and making them into one mega plan, whether you're grouping them by industry or grouping them by saver type. Um, I think all of a sudden you can really, you know, almost categorize your audiences into one PEP if you so choose uh, and service them very efficiently uh, without needing to have a, a super broad workforce to address every single plan uh, on an individual basis. Granted, they still want to do that, but the PEP creates a, a means of efficiency to achieve that. And Randy, when it comes to legislation, I mean, you know, we're obviously talking days before the end of the new year. CARES Act has become uh, an important part of what we've been living through in terms of dealing with the pandemic. But do we get back to the SECURE Act? Do we see a SECURE Act 2.0? Do we see some additional legislation? Is there a, uh, uh, you know, appetite for that given everything we've been through thus far with the pandemic and the costs associated with CARES Act? Mm. Yeah, I think when you talk, when, I, when I've spoken to some of the retirement firms that really work closely with our legislative bodies, um, there's an appetite for Secure 2.0. Uh, obviously, the best time to strike is when the iron is hot. And uh, with Secure already passed, I think Secure 2.0 is not too far off the horizon in terms of being introduced, you know, sharpened up uh, and the like. 
Uh, as far as like where record keeper and provider attention goes, I do think that secure will re-enter the focus and the frame here. Um, a lot of firms obviously went into survival mode in, in March and April, and they just wanted to get by, retain the assets of investors, make sure investors' uh, money was safe, whether it was in a 401k or, or wherever else, IRA, et cetera. They wanted to make sure that everybody's investments were intact uh, and protected. Uh, and I think now that we're having some clarity and we're having a little bit of a rebound here, uh, especially with the with the vaccines starting to be distributed, uh, I think they're going to reframe the conversations in the new year, maybe in the latter half more so, to be about the Secure Act, all the efficiencies it brought, uh, and the new opportunities for retirement investors themselves. Right, all of a sudden we can have in plan income, and I, I would estimate that those conversations uh, wouldn't likely be focused on the volatility we saw in 2020 here. And Randy, you bring up guaranteed income or retirement income, however you want to define it. You talked about financial wellness. How much, when you're ta out talking to uh, members of the industry, how much are they talking about retirement income? The different products are not just insurance products, right? I mean, there are investment products, there are laddered bond products. I mean, there's, there's a plethora of products being, being offered now. Yeah, I think uh, I can't escape a conversation in industry without talking about retirement income, and that's a good thing. Um, the fact that it's on so many uh, asset managers and mutual fund families' minds is a good thing for uh, Americans and retirement investors overall, because it means that now the people that are supplying your investment products uh, really want to build it in. Um, like I said, I've seen a couple different ways in which they want to achieve this. Like I said, uh, you know, bringing in an annuity is definitely one avenue, but um, some have even talked about just building a whole tier into the target date fund uh, that is just purely based around income. Uh, there's a few providers that already have income capabilities built into their offerings, Prudential, DFA, uh, and a few other key players, but it's not gotten widespread integration yet, too. Uh, part of it is because somebody's probably waiting for a big player to jump and then they'll follow suit, or vice versa. Somebody's waiting for an innovator uh, to come disrupt the space, either you know a boutique retirement firm or maybe a mid-sized player. And then everybody will put their uh, their feelers in the water and either jump into the deep end or wade into the shallow end. Uh, it just all depends, I guess, on who gets there first uh, and who does it well first, uh, more so than just who's the first one to be in the space. Yeah, Randy, I you know I've been amazed that even during this pandemic, still talking about retirement, but also talking about fee litigation that still continues. Any thoughts? You know, I mean, just recently I saw a couple stories. I think as of this morning, as as of our taping. Any thoughts about fee litigation? Is that still a concern, a major concern for both providers, asset managers, record keepers, but also plant sponsors? Is that at the top of their list? Let's not get sued. Uh, I, I think it's always uh, ever pressing. It's always in the peripheral vision, right? When it comes into the, the forefront and when it's in your uh, right in front of you and there's a lawsuit in hand, uh, that's obviously when you're not having as much fun as a firm or as an investor. But uh, I think fee pressure and fee concern is always top of mind. Um, what makes it interesting right now is obviously uh, firms starting to look into new asset classes that maybe have a higher price tag and uh, they're trying to justify does it make sense to bring this unique asset class into the target date mix or into the retirement plan mix uh, at the expense of the cost which obviously gets handed on to the investor. Figuring out how they absorb that cost is ultimately going to be uh, you know what determines how much less you know how much uh, uh, you know litigation they face in the future. Uh, if they yeah. absorb it themselves and they handle it I think they're fine. Uh, I think if they start, you know, getting into really high price asset classes and, uh, you know, forcing that onto the investor without much consultation of the advisor or the sponsor beforehand, uh, I think that's when we'll get to all the red tape and uh, they'll be having more fun in court than they will be uh, running uh, money for clients. Yeah, it doesn't seem like a lot of fun to me. Last question, Randy. We just had a major, major, major hack that impacted many government agencies and also looks to be like it's uh, gone after some major for-profit or private sector organizations as well. Any thoughts as it relates to the importance of cybersecurity, how you maintain cybersecurity? Obviously, this is over the overarching theme of American defense, but this has to kind of ring true or be important now for providers and plant sponsors as well. Yeah. I mean, all year long, I've heard about people talking about, we're going to upgrade our tech, we're going to upgrade our tech. Um, and when I hear that talk, usually it's like, oh, we're going to enhance our client facing portal. We're going to advance the software that our advisors are using. Um, I'm of the view that I really think it needs to be on cybersecurity at this point. And uh, firms almost need to undertake it themselves to bring their uh, cybersecurity up to speed, right? We can't always count on the US government to uh, know how investment management software works to the point of doing cybersecurity for it. 
Uh, I'm sure they could incentivize and subsidize it in some way if they so chose to do so. Um, but I think ultimately, the, the not to say the burden of it, but really the responsibility of it is going to fall on actual fund providers and people that are, you know, maintaining assets for clients, right? At the end of the day, uh, it's your job to make sure that money is safe, whether it's from markets or from cyber attacks. Um, you know, there's two different beasts that you could be staring down this year. And um, I don't doubt that, you know, we're going to see more third party players coming in and offering you know, improve cybersecurity. Um, if it's built out within that, that firm probably has a hotshot tech department that can do the, the firewall and all the necessary protections needed. But I think as of right now, um, you know, we've seen systems created that have been super efficient and then they still get hacked. Um, and it's at this point, it's like, well, what are we gonna do to change that? You know, we really need to uh, disrupt what's disrupting us, which sounds kind of counterintuitive or not counterintuitive, but almost sounds, you know, a little bit ironic. Um, but at this point, you know, cybersecurity is top of mind for a lot of these firms. Uh, it's just a matter of investing in it and actually putting their money where their mouth is when it comes to defending clients' assets. Yeah. Well, Randy, it's always a pleasure chatting with you. Really appreciate uh, the sit down today. I want to wish you and your family a very happy new year, and we will see you again in 2021. Of course. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks, Randy. Great to see you. Thanks for sharing your perspective. And that wraps up this episode of BRN AM. Have a topic of interest or someone you think we should talk to, then drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the information in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more, all in one place, check out today's edition of The Morning Pulse. So until tomorrow, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Are you being audited and do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a Tax Doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.